So, so all those demonstration videos, they are kind of linked from our college's YouTube channel. So, um, so that's why I have this, had this tab open. Uh, let me, let's see here. What do I want to do? Let me go into library so that all those, uh, my recommended videos that have, this account has a history turned off. So whatever recommendations show up, it's just random. <laughs> I totally disassociate myself with any of the recommendations that you see in this channel. <laughs> what I do have in this library are the playlists. And there's some playlists that I had from Physics 4B. Uh, maybe recently, yeah, that's the way to go. Um, so Physics 4B lab videos is where I kind of wanted to go from. And uh, I think you've seen this video last time, uh, the last week, the balancing tab. So I don't need to get into that. So think of these. So oh, I showed this video at one of the virtual classrooms before, think of the one before spring break. Um, and it's uh, in this set with the electrostatics lab that I thought there might be something that I would want to show. Um, hmm, what's so fun to show? Oh, uh, let me do, let me show a couple things with the Van de Graaff generator. So this is the uh, Van de Graaff generator. And I think uh, you've seen a brief explanation of a Van de Graaff generator in this video that you saw last week, um, or at least when I recorded this video, I, so uh, one second, I'm gonna uh, change my sharing setting so that it's optimized for sharing video clip. And um, so in this video, you have seen this kind of brief explanation of how the Van der Graaff generator is supposed to work. So, and the fun thing here is that due to property of conductor, these extra charges end up on the surface of the conductor. I end up on the outer surface of conductor away from the inner surface. So, so that's the Van der Graaff generator. And one demonstration I want you to show uh, is this demonstration. I think in this demonstration, what I'm showing is the spark uh, between the two, uh, two, two the metal spheres. One of them is Van der Graaff generator. The other one is, um, it's just a grounding sphere. All it is is just a spherical shell of conductor that's grounded through this wire. So let me just, uh, oops. Based on the video. Let me just play through. This video is a demonstration of the Van der Graaff generator for use in electrostatics lab activity. The video will show shots from two angles. Some elements have deliberately been added to allow length measurements based on the video. All parts of the setup relevant to the demonstration is included in the video shot or, where needed, explained through this voiceover. I will try to limit this voiceover only to information needed for lab activity. The metal sphere next to the Van der Graaff generator is grounded through the wire show. So you see that when the spheres are farther apart, the electrical breakdown, or actually it could be from left to right or right to left. From the video, there isn't really a way to tell. Um, it, uh, the breakdown happens um, less frequently and depending on the distance, at least up to some limit, uh, when they are less frequent, the, the sparks are seem larger. Uh, it has to do with how electrical breakdowns occur. Electrical, um, the physical quantity that controls most, how electrical breakdowns occur is um, 
it's the electric field strength. And in this Van der Graaff generator, the quantity that's uh, controlled mostly is not the electric field, but it's the voltage. So, and so this Van der Graaff generator, with, through the accumulation of charge, it reaches some amount of voltage on the surface. And, um, and I would ask you to recall from last week, the relationship between voltage, electric field, and um, uh, some sense of distance, the separation. Uh, in the simplest sense, a voltage difference could be connected to a product of electric field and displacement. It's kind of related in a similar way as how potential energy is related to the uh, force uh, exerted by the conservative force and the displacement force times the displacement being worked on, and there is connection there. So here, um, when these two spheres are closer together, it, it takes less of a voltage difference between the spheres for the electric field between them to reach a higher value. And uh, when the electric field reaches a certain value in dry air, it's around 30 kilovolts per centimeter, that's when the electrical breakdown occurs. So, um, so when these spheres are closer together, like over uh, closer together over here, then uh, electrical breakdown occurred when this reached the voltage of, I don't know, uh, 50 kilovolts then the, at, the, um, at the highest value of electric field, it might have been 30 kilovolts per centimeter between them. Now, as they are placed the further apart, these have to reach higher voltage before electric field is strong enough for the breakdown to occur. And at that higher voltage, the amount of charge stores is, lar is larger, so the sparks are larger, and that's what you're seeing here. So you see through the wire show. At some point, the distance is so far that the breakdown doesn't occur in the usual well-defined path. The hissing sound you hear is due to corona discharge. Yeah, corona discharge is one of the ways the charges leak. Once they are so far apart that there's no visible breakdown between them. The crackling sound you hear is also due to corona discharge. I forget if I got shocked while doing that. And after you do this for a while, you start to smell ozone because... And I'm just uh, discharging the Van der Graaff generator so that I don't get shocked because all these discharges um, uh, um, I'll use this stream all these discharges they um, uh, they you know cause oxygen molecules to break down and create ozone mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it handle for conducting yeah I think it's acrylic it's definitely plastic it, it, it's probably acrylic um, it felt like acrylic, but I didn't test. Um, so most, the rest of the video, I think I'm just doing length measurement because this was for a lab where people could actually calculate values. I don't think um, that's necessary for us. So let me just look through the thumbnail to make sure that we don't need it. And then I will skip out on the rest. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, let me do this. So this is where I'm just showing the- So the, the insides of this is where I'm just gonna show the structure of the things. So I'm gonna go turn the light on and in the rest of this video, I will show the, the insides of the metal sphere and the Van der Graaff generator, just to show how simple they are. The metal plate there, other than holding the screws together, I don't think it does anything. Yeah. 
they might be interchangeable, the upper half. And this is how the charges are carried up to the Van de Graaff generator. A motor at the bottom moves the rubber belt and the rubber belt moves charges up which are collected on the comb that you see at the top there. So this model of Van der Graaff generator uses electric motor, but it doesn't have to. There are cheaper models where there's a hand crank that you crank to uh, uh, accumulate static electric charge on the sphere. So that's Van der Graaff generator. It's one of the common tools we use uh, in electrostatic experiments and demonstrations. And one fun machine I want you to show well, it's something called a Wimschers. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce the name right. I believe it is an English name. So it's either Wimschers or Wimschers. If it's English, it should be Wimschers. <laughs> um, so let me show you. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, play the demonstration. This video is a demonstration of the Wimschers machine for use in electrostatics lab activity. The video will show shots from two angles. Some length measurements will be shown in video, which can be used to calibrate the length scales. All parts of the setup relevant to the demonstration is included in the video shot or where needed explained through this voiceover. I will try to limit this voiceover only to information needed for lab activity. Here the sound you hear is due to the electrical discharge. The amount of charges involved are small so you can't quite see it, but the sound should be the indication of discharge. The discharge may be due to corona discharge. It is hard to tell when there is no visible spark. So what's needed for the visible spark to occur is on accumulation of charge and they all have to get discharged all at once so that as the electron is electrons are traveling through the ionized the path um, it excites the air molecules and that's what's creating that visible light so this machine it has these two uh Leiden jars uh, which are used to store that electric charge and uh, you know it stores some amount so that you saw that one spark but this doesn't produce those charges at regular enough interval or at the same rate as the Van der Graaff generator can to create visible spark uh, frequently. Um, uh, let me just play a little bit more. Well, see if there's anything more interesting. Yeah, the length measurements are uninteresting for us. Oh. Yeah. So um, if you're interested, I would encourage you to look up Wimshur's machine on your own. Their principle of, of operation is actually quite fascinating. It's uh, in some sense conceptually more complicated than Van der Graaff generator, even though as a, I guess even the construction actually does look a little more complicated, even though operation is simpler. This doesn't require any electricity, you just turn a crank. Um, now, one thing I was using this for, was as a source of a high voltage that's uh, more controllable than Van der Graaff generator is. Sometimes Van der Graaff generator produces too much charge too quickly. Um, so that's uh, what I'm doing later here. I'm connecting this machine to, um, to an, an electrostatic arrangement. And oh. three measurements, there's enough information to calibrate the main shot of the video. That's in it. this setup, I have connected two conducting plates to the electrodes of the Wimschers machine. The conducting plates are circular and you are seeing the side view. The electrodes of the Wimschers machine have been placed far from each other so that the discharge only occurs through the conducting plates. The markings on the rails at the bottom are in centimeters. Please be mindful of the perspective effect as you use them to calibrate the length of scale in the video. 
I'm trying to keep the plate parallel, but as you can see that the discharge occurs preferentially at the bottom, the bottom portions of the plates are closer. Yeah, so it's easier to see the visible discharge here. Oh, I see the question about the charges, if the charges scale with the diameter of the disk. In some sense, yes. In, and this is the sense in which the answer is yes. Um, so with an experiment like this, where I'm looking for electrical discharge through air, really the one single quantity that I am keeping constant is the electric field strength at which that uh, discharge occurs. So, um, so the um, so and that electric maximum electric field strength when the discharge occurs, it's at about thirty kilovolt per centimeter at the point where it's maximum. So you know, in this arrangement at the bottom here, um, at the top it's always a little bit below that. That's why you don't see discharges up here. And the other things that can vary uh, while keeping that maximum electric field constant is one distance. That's why when you have a shorter distance between them, you see the discharge occur more frequently because these plates do not need to reach as a higher voltage for the discharge to occur. And now this is the second thing. Um, the amount of voltage that, uh, or sorry, amount of charge that's stored on the plate at a particular value of voltage that scales with the, the size of the disks. So, and it's the same deal with the other geometric objects, like uh, this Wimshurst machine, it has uh, these uh, balls here. And the amount of charge that is stored on these conductors before discharge occurs, keeping everything else constant, voltage and electric field constant, will depend on the size of the ball. That's why with the larger Van der Graaff generator, you have you have a, you see brighter sparks because there's more amount of charge stored before discharge occurs. So once the discharge occurs, it it forms just a bright path that you can see. Um, yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, oh, charge that that I do not believe uh, uh, depends on the size of this disk. It's uh, one of the. Uh, let me just uh, look uh, Google search it up so that you can see it. Uh, I mean, Charged machine. It's a it's a fascinating principle of operation. So each individual plate on the disk it doesn't store um, significant amount of charge. This is kind of animation of how the charging occurs. And really, let's see. Um, so I guess so. These, in the, these individual conducting plates, they don't accumulate that much charge. The small imbalance of charges that they accumulate, they are gathered by this brush that's uh, barely contacting the disk. So uh, long story short, because it, it's not these uh, rotating disks themselves that are um, accumulating or storing the charge, the size of the disk here shouldn't matter. Uh, what should matter more is the other geometries like the um, <laughs> like uh, other geometries, like geometry of the Leiden jar. Here, the biggest limiting factor would be the size of this uh, conductor because um, this size of the conductor basically limits how high a voltage this conducting thing can reach. Um, yeah, Exploratorium in San Francisco probably has something like this, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see here. Is there anything else I'm not sure? I think that discharge thing was the only thing. And um, okay, I think, and there's a, do I want to demonstrate electroscope? I think I want to. Uh, let me just, uh, let me show two more videos. I want to show this. And then I want to show something called electric world. Um, those are kind of fun demos that uh, illustrate some, uh, this illustrate some feature of uh, electricity. Oh, okay, this, let me just play. Video is a demonstration of electroscopes. We will use it with HV Genekan, de demonstrated in another video in order to illustrate 
interaction of electrostatic charges. Uh, just quickly, the Genecon thing, it's this device here. Just think of it as a portable a static charge uh, producing thing. Yeah, that's all it does. It, it's kind of small scale, uh, worse version of Van de Graaff generator and the windshirt shirt machine. The video will show shots from two angles. Please use the second shot to observe the number of turns of the hand crank. Two electroscopes are shown simultaneously to illustrate some variability in the demonstration due to real-world imperfections. The black leads are connected to the negative charge source of HV Genecon. The red leads are connected to the positive charge source of HV Genecon. I'm discharging the two electroscopes just to be safe. And I'll be turning the hand crank to charge the scopes. As the charges are transferred to the electroscope, which is made almost entirely of conducting material, both the support and needle are charged with the same charge. So the needle is shown being repelled from the vertical support. And you know, this is not a quantitatively accurate device. That's Just what charging. these two things are showing. And we'll give it another go. Sometimes it takes some time for charges to transfer. Additional quarter turn. Oh. Guess I'm not really demonstrating it here. Um, so if uh, I charge this up and wait for a long period of time, this needle will eventually reach their neutral position, even though even if I don't discharge it actively. And one of the ways it happens is at these uh, sharp corners of the needle, that's where uh, charges can kind of link. Uh, the, at the sharp corners, you tend to form high, stronger electric field at the same value of voltage or charge density. And so, uh, so the, let me show you the next demo, which demonstrates what I'm talking about more, uh, more clearly. Uh, it's uh, this one here, um, something called the electric whirl. It's... Um, um, yeah, it's a kind of demo thing that you can buy, although you need something to power it with. And this is a um, recording of another virtual class session that uh, I'll play now. Uh, yeah, four minutes. I was testing this just before the meeting. And uh, let me first show you what I mean, and then I'll go through a brief explanation of what it is you are saying. So uh, I'm going to start with what you just saw, the spark. And that, that, that's kind of an indicator that the Van der Graaff generator is charging. And let me do something from there that will show something different. Okay. okay. So right now it's charging and then discharging, charging and then discharging. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this thing. It's a simple device, you know, nothing complicated near the Van der Graaff generator. And you are going to see something that looks different now. Notice how the Van der Graaff generator is no longer discharging to the grounded sphere. And this is doing something else. And what this is illustrating is that the Van der Graaff generator is discharging. Somehow the electric charges that's accumulating on the sphere, it's finding some way to get off of it without visibly discharging to that other sphere. And it's actually discharging to this uh, wind vane looking thing. Let me turn this off. And, um, and it's doing it without making any contact. 
um, it uh, and this uh, wind this uh, thing it starts to rotate when it uh, when it receives charge because the way the geometry of this is a shape it's um, designed to make a charges preferentially come out from this end so that okay. kind of makes it so that it propels this over some period of time and that's why it's so it's spinning so what you saw was that there was a transfer of electro electric charge from the van de Graaff generator to this device without any direct visible touching what did the one of image I and that what am, oh, oh i see it oh uh, wait what did I just place two different videos together? Yeah, this is fine. Uh, I don't think. <laughs> um, yeah, I see a question. Would it still turn if it wasn't um, wasn't insulated? Yeah, you know, if uh, if it discharges through me, then uh, it wouldn't turn. Although my guess is. So for the charges to discharge it through me, it has to go somewhere. It has to go usually, you know, discharge to the ground through my shoe. And I think the sharp, sharp corners of uh, these things, they limit the voltage enough that it might still turn even if it weren't insulated. I haven't really tested it because when I do these demos, it's not, I don't want to get shocked. <laughs> so, but um, I, I if I had to guess, I think it could still work. Um, it, the, this handle not being insulated wouldn't prevent it from working, I think, although I haven't tested that. 